Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I hope you're all well this evening. I will just wait a minute for a few more people to join us. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone who has joined us so far when we're waiting for everybody else. And I'll introduce myself. My name is Peter Hulton and I am the Training and Engagement Officer for Northern England with Glacoma UK. Our speaker this evening is Joanne Hodgkinson, and I'll pass over to Joanne in a short while. Uh, Joanne will be talking and taking us through some examples of glaucoma jargon after my introduction to the session. I'm so glad so many of you have chosen to spend your evening with us, and I'm just going to spend a few moments talking about the format of today's talk and a little bit about Zoom. There will be two short polls launched during the webinar. These are to help us see the difference the sessions are having. I'm going to launch the first one now, and this will stay open for about a minute or two. Okay, the poll should be there now for everybody. I'll leave it up for a few moments. If you can fill it in, please, that would be great. Um, I think there might be an error in the question, Peter, because it says, how much do you know about glaucoma and cataract? But I think the question should be, how much do you know about the jargon around glaucoma? So if you just imagine it, sort of how much do you know about the topic of today's webinar, about the jargon associated with glaucoma? Right, well spotted. Thank you, Joanne. <laughs> Okay, I think we'll end the poll now. Quite a few people have managed to answer it. Thank you very much. After Joanne has finished speaking, we'll have a question and answer session. Please post any questions for her in the question and answer box. And don't forget to like questions that others have asked if you like them. And unfortunately, we're not on Facebook this evening due to technical issues. So please be aware if you're using captions on Zoom, they may not be successfully translated. And don't forget to post your questions. So I'll get started now. Uh, our aim this evening is to make more sense of the jargon and abbreviations that is used in the letters sent from your consultant to your GP. When you get one of these letters for the first time, it can be a bit overwhelming with the c content. And if you keep getting them, you really do want to understand what you're getting. Our objective this evening is to understand what your jargon is, to know why it is used, to take a little look at abbreviations as well, and to explore and explain it all to you. So what is jargon? I've got a definition here from the Cambridge Dictionary. It is special words and phrases that are used by particular groups of people, especially in their work. So it could be legal or computer jargon, but for us tonight, we are looking at medical jargon here, or medical terminology. So why is jargon used? Jargon is the language of specialized terms used by a group or profession. It's common shorthand among experts and used sensibly, it can be in a quick and effective way of communicating. And jargon can help communicate specific concepts. But, there is always a but, it can also make things less obvious or accessible to others. So abbreviation, we'll have a look at a definition of abbreviation. It's a short form of a word or phrase, again from the Cambridge in Dictionary. Uh, I've got an example here. ITV is the abbreviation for independent television. An easy one here as an example, but it's not so easy if you're unaware of the word or words being abbreviated and the mix of jargon to deal with it all at the same time. This is why we're calling it a cocktail this evening. Over to you, Joanne. Great. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for the introduction. And, and just so you know, obviously, the um, advertised speaker today was our helpline manager, Helen, um, but she's 
um, not available tonight. So I've stepped in. So apologies if you are ex especially looking forward to um, see Helen this evening. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to um, cover what I'm sure she would very, very well have covered this evening. So we're going to take a look at a couple of sort of example um, letters that could, you know, two fictional sample letters that might have been sent from a consultant to a GP after an appointment. There's quite a lot of information that's in those letters, um, which you will invariably um, be copied into. Um, so we're going to have a little look about what the jargon means um, and, and what that might mean for your vision. Um, so, Pete, if you could do the first example. Yeah. Um, so this is what your letter might look like. This was just one that we made up. Obviously, it's not it's not real. Um, you'll see that it's from the, the kind of hospital department and it's been sent to the to the GP, to your GP, and you're copied in, which I always think is a bit, a bit um, it's not ideal, is it, that you get a copy of a letter that's sent about you. Um, I think some hospitals are trying to do a better job of writing to the patient, um, but for the time being, many of you might just get a copy of a letter sent to the GP. You'll have your contact details at the top um, and your, you know, your date of birth and your NHS number so that you know it's definitely about you um, and so that the doctor can, the GP can kind of log that in the system. So this fictional letter says, I saw this delightful young lady for a routine appointment yesterday. She was diagnosed with primary open angle glaucoma in 2006 and has experienced significant progression since then. There's quite a lot in that sentence, in those in that short short paragraph. So the fact that it was a routine appointment, um, that tells the GP, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing kind of sinister going on. There's no escalation. It was just as expected. Um, delightful young lady. Um, there's lots of jokes about kind of the letters that GPs and doctors send to one another. Um, you know, basically, kind of if you were trouble, um, the the GP might find that out in a kind of um, some like sentence that's written in the letter. But in this case, the um, ophthalmologist um, was um, very, you know, very happy to see that that patient. So um, these are, this is rumour. I don't, I don't know how true these stories are. They're kind of strange not, um, descriptions of patients written in the letters. Um, but anyway, um, when it says it, the patient has experienced significant progression since then, that sounds really positive. Um, but uh, that means in this case that your your glaucoma is developing, or this Jane's glaucoma is developing, um, is getting worse, unfortunately. That's what we mean by progression. Um, and her intraocular pressures are OD 19 millimetres of mercury and OS 23 millimetres of mercury. So um, this OD is, um, is, is medical speak for oculus dexter or right eye. And the OS is ocular sinister or left eye. Um, lots of medical stuff is based on Latin. That's obviously the root of, of kind of lots of um, medical teaching. You know, historically, it was all sort of based on Greek and Roman um, uh, you know, philosophers and natural philosophers and things. Um, also, the reason we, we tend to stick with or met doctors tend to stick with Latin these days um, is the sort of standard terminology makes it quite international. So um, if you were to, uh, if doctors of diff different nationalities were talking, they would be able to understand the terminology because it's based on kind of not not English or French or, you know, Greek or whatever it is. It, it, it's that sort of very standardised um, language and obviously lots of research is very international so it means that kind of the research and development and, and sort of communication between doctors is, is generally good that's why they use this terminology as Pete explained in the in the introduction and then the unit um uh millimeters of mercury um that's what hg is if you cast your memories back to your chemistry lessons at school hg is mercury um it's a really old-fashioned um uh unit of measurement um, that is used for um, for pressures generally, say your blood pressure, um, you know, 120 over 80 is also based on millimetres of mercury. And it's basically how much pressure one millimetre sort of depth of mercury might apply to the to the surface of the eye. It's a very, very strange unit. Um, fortunately, it's not used, it's not um, measured using actual mercury these days. It's just a sort of throwback to kind of hundreds of years ago when um, scientists were learning to experiment with pressure, but it's the unit we use um, and um, it creates quite nice sort of numbers that are easy to handle, you know, 19 and 23. It's not like we're dealing with really big numbers or really small numbers. Um, and then the next, this is returning to the letter. I've carried out the Humphrey 32 seater today. She finds it difficult to fixate and her responses are somewhat unreliable. Her mean deviation is OD minus four decibels and OS minus three decibels. So the Humphrey uh, 32 seater is talking about a visual field test. 
um, the Humphrey is the machine, some of you might know the terminology, and the 32 is talking about kind of how, how wide a visual field we're looking at, um, and the CT is just how the, how the data is collected, but it's but that's the consultant for the GP, we did, a, we did a visual field. She finds it difficult to fixate, and her responses are somewhat unreliable. So fixation is when you should be looking at that central point in the middle of the visual field, if you're finding it difficult to fixate, that means your eyes are wandering um, and therefore you might be kind of missing spots or, um, you know, you might be a rogue clicker. Um, so it's basically, again, sort of saying to the to the GP, um, you know, or we're not, you know, this, we're not quite sure about the numbers. There might be a bit of variability in there. If we were to do the test again, we might get a different number. Um, so, sorry, Pete, could you just go back a sentence? Yeah, of course. Slide? Uh, the bit about the mean deviation. So this is a measure of how much visual field you've lost. So if your mean deviation is zero, you've got a complete kind of normal visual field, you don't have a glaucoma. And the more negative the number, the more visual field you've lost. Um, so a mean deviation of around minus 20 decibels indicates that you've lost quite a lot of visual field. So someone who's on minus four, minus three, um, is is maybe not, hasn't lost that much vision. Um, but yeah, if you're getting sort of more than 10, you might be starting to really kind of notice a little bit of field loss. And strangely, the units are in decibels, um, which is the same as sound. And that's because they're both, even though they seem very different, they're both about um, your sensitivity. So, so when it's on your visual field, it's how sensitive your eyes are. And when it's decibels of sound, which is where you might have seen the term decibels before, that's about, your, um, about how sensitive your ears are. That's why it's the same unit. Because it's measuring it's like our senses and what's going on in the brain. Uh, right, next slide, please. Um, and then this is also in the letter. Her plot to disc ratio has gradually increased over the last few years and is now OD 0.65 and OS 0.7. So your cup to disc ratio is what's happening in the back of the eye um, where the optic nerve leaves the eye um, and goes to the um, starts going to the brain. And I always imagine it a bit like being a, a kind of ha a hair, like a ponytail. Um, and the nerves are sort of being drawn from across the back of the eye, um, a bit like the way that your hair is sort of being drawn into the back of your head, um, if you've got a ponytail. Um, and it forms a sort of funnel shape, like a like a kind of going through a, um, a hair bubble. Um, and um, as they as the sort of nerves that come across the back of the head um, to the back of the eye, and that that funnel shape is called the cup, and the hole is called the disc. Because that's a bit what it looks like if you were to sort of look through the front of the eye. Um, during your appointment, the ophthalmologist is doing that, um, looking through the eye, and they can see this sort of cup and this and this hole shape, this disc. So in a in a healthy eye, the the nerve is filling that whole space. So there's quite a small cup or a funnel shape within the larger disc. But as glaucoma gets worse, the nerve cells are, are, are dying. They're not they're not so healthy any longer. So they're taking up less space, and the cup gets bigger. But that disc is still staying the same size. So imagine the kind of hair bubble is staying the same size, but the thickness of hair within that bubble is um, is getting smaller when you've got um, when you've got glaucoma. So a healthy cup to disc ratio is um, 0.5 or smaller. Um, so you want a kind of very small cup within within the disc. Then there's a picture below that you can see that with the kind of the um the disc and the cup and the the healthy nerves or the, the less healthy nerves in glaucoma. Uh, so the last bit of the letter, she's prescribed Pitaxolol 0.5% PFSDU bid and latanoprost 50 micrograms per milliliter nocte, although some adherence issues are evident. Due to this, we are recommending her for SLP within six months. So on earth does this sentence say? Well, metaxolol is the type of eye drop, um, it's a beta blocker. 0.5% uh, is saying that within every, you know, 100 millilitres of um, of the sort of eye drop, 0.5% of it is um, the acting product and the rest is, you know, water and other things that are kind of keeping it, um, uh, keeping the eye drop kind of good to use. Um, PF means it's got, um, means it's preservative free. So the preservatives in the bottle can make your eyes sore um, and preservative free drops are often better for your eyes. They're less painful. Um, but if, um, uh, you know, you might want to speak to your um, your ophthalmologist if your eyes are, are sore and itchy, whether you want preservative free drops or not. The SDU bit means single dose unit. 
Um, you might see it as written as unit dose. Um, you might call them vials. Those are kind of little ones that you use on um, one vial of every day. Um, and the bid bit means bis in da. So that's um, twice a day in Latin, kind of medically speak. Um, and nocte, which appears um, later in the sentence, means at night in the same sort of you know medical speak. Um, again, it's just it's just a sort of Latin abbreviation. It's easier to say um, did bis in da than um, you know twice a day, twelve hours apart. Um, and the nocte again at night. Um, that weird symbol. Um, uh, the, the after the 50 um, means micro um, in um, so it's micrograms which is a millionth of a gram so in every um, milliliter of latanoprost you have 50 micrograms of um, the active product the latanoprost and everything else is you know water and salts and things that keep it stable um, so they're just different ways the 0.5 percent and the 50 micrograms per milliliter are both different ways that um, medicines might be made up um, in terms of uh, talking about the concentration of it, so whether it's a kind of highly concentrated um, uh, uh, makeup of your of your um, of your medicine, um, and again, what what else has been said in the letter? Some adherence issues are evident, so that's sort of saying to the from the consultant to the GP that you know this this person doesn't take in their eye drops every single day. That's what adherence issues would be. That maybe they're forgetting, or they're getting in a muddle, and they're you know taking their latanoprost in the morning or something. Um, and so the consultant is saying to the GP that they think SLT laser treatment might be the right option for this person um, because they're, they're struggling with their eye drops um, and, and therefore having the laser treatment would relieve them of the pressure of um, using their eye drops. So that's the first letter. And then we've got another letter imagining a different patient, um, still from the same doctor, the same um, hospital. Um, and to the same GP, it talks about a different patient, a, a man this time, John Brown, um, still a, a kind of made up patient. Um, so what is the consultant saying to the GP? They are saying, I saw this gentleman in my clinic today, 14th of December, 2022, for a follow-up of his POCG, which was diagnosed in 2019. He's had bilateral YAG PIs and is pseudophagic in his left eye. So what on earth is going on in that sentence? or that, that paragraph, a follow-up of his POCG. So that's saying to the, um, the GP that this person has had their, um, has had an appointment before and this is kind of, you know, that regular monitoring. PACG is primary angle closure glaucoma. So it's the slightly more um, unusual version of glaucoma um, that can um, come on sort of quite suddenly. If, um, if, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about angles um, in a second, but it, it's a sort of different type of glaucoma to what might, most of you might have. He said bilateral, so that means both sides. So that would be this, this treatment that he's had, to, he's had in two eyes. YAG-PI is um, a, a, a type of laser treatment. So again, it's different to the, the laser treatment that was mentioned in the first letter. Um, uh, and the, the YAG is the type of um, machinery that's used. And the PI is peripheral iridotomy. And it's used to treat um, narrow angles and primary angle closure glaucoma. Um, and it creates a tiny hole in the sort of edge of the iris, um, which is the color, the colored part of your eye. And what that does is it provides a kind of alternative route for the fluid to drain, to move from the um, from the sort of the behind the iris where it's made in the cellular body um, through into the front bit of the eye, the aqueous, um, sorry, the anterior chamber where, where most of the aqueous is and drain out. And what's happened off, often is that that, um, that drainage flow is sort of impeded um, because the, the iris is pushing against the front part of the eye. Um, and, and it keeps the keeps the drainage angle open. So it's um, it's a very quick laser treatment, a bit like um, SLT, the more common one. Um, and it's often done in a kind of preventative method um, if you have narrow angles. Um, and it can be very, very successful in sort of treating the root cause of that angle closure and therefore stopping further glaucoma. Uh, and the pseudophagic, um, that means uh, that the person has had, has a fake lens, an artificial lens um, in their left eye. Um, so if you've had a cataract op operation, what, what they will have done is taken out that lens, um, your sort of natural lens, and replaced it with an artificial one. Um, 
for, a, for treatment of a cataract, that's because your lens has gone cloudy, which naturally happens over time. Most older people have, have mild cataracts to some extent. Um, but the reason it can be a good treatment for glaucoma is because um, the, the natural lens is quite fat, um, uh, sort of quite a kind of, um, yeah, kind of bowl shape, but the um, artificial lens is much thinner, so it just creates a bit more space in the eye, so it, it can be quite successful again in, in kind of treating um, glaucoma. So some people might have had their um, lens replaced, even if they don't have a cataract, um, because it can be very successful in, in just creating a bit more space in the eye and therefore reducing the pressure and reducing glaucoma. Great, next slide please, Peter. So, on examination today, VA measured right eye 612 minus 2 unaided, coming up to 612 pH, and left eye 66 minus 2, coming up to 66 plus 1 pH. So, gosh, that's some ability to get if ever there was one. So, this is talking about your visual acuity, and that's um, measuring your distance vision. So, um, how well is your classic kind of um, vision test that you think of when you think of an optometrist? Um, and it's when you look at that kind of lit up chart of letters at the other end of the optometrist screen and read down as far as you can. Um, and most commonly it's measured using the Snellen chart um, and one eye at a time is, is being measured. Um, and the, the numbers are kind of talking about how well you can see something like six meters away. Um, and if your vision is six, six, that means you can see from six meters away what someone with normal vision could also see at six meters away. But if your vision is 612, um, that means that um, you can see at six metres what a normal person can see at, well, or someone with normal vision, sorry, could see at 12 metres. So the closer those numbers are to one another, the closer they are to six, the better your vision is, basically. Um, the unaided bit is um, whether they're wearing glasses or not. So unaided would be without wearing glasses, which is particularly significant, obviously, if you're short sighted. Um, and then the plus or minus um, after the letter is indicating, um, sorry, after the numbers is indicating whether you can read kind of a couple of letters on the next line, um, or um, if it's a plus two, um, you can read a couple, you know, two more letters on the next line. Um, and if it's a minus, a minus, that means that you haven't quite read all of the letters on that line. So it's just a bit of an indication as to whether it's kind of just scraping onto that that point, or you know, you're, you're actually nearly at the at the, at the next level up. So again, it's all a bit of um, explaining the doctor kind of how, you know, how, how well a person reading on the screen. Um, you might, there are two variants out there. So the Snellen one is the, the more common and we might, so the 6-6 refers to, is the same as 20-20 vision, but 20 is referring to feet as opposed to six in meters. Um, if you go on to the next slide, please, Peter. Um, you've got two slightly different variants here. So actually what you might see is the one that looks a bit more like the one on the bottom, which is called a logmar. Um, which is, um, uh, yeah, so the, the advantage of the logmar compared to the Snellen is if you look at the two variants, you've got you've got um, only one chart, one letter on the top row of the Snellen and then two and then three and then four and then five, which makes means actually if you're, if you're struggling to see the second row, you've only got two chances to, to kind of get that letter right. Whereas the logmar one, um, there every single row has five letters on it. So it means you've got a kind of equal chance on each row of, of getting the same number of letters. So it's a slightly more accurate way of measuring someone's vision. So you probably more and more see the logma, um, but it's basically testing the same thing as the Snellen chart, um, just in a more accurate way. So a bit of um, terminology here again. Um, so IOP, you might know this term, is um, intraocular pressure. Um, or eye pressure, and it's often measured with um, uh, more alphabetic spaghetti. Goldman, acclamation, tonometry, what on earth does that mean? Well, Goldman is the name of the um, person who, who developed the, the test and also the name of the sort of technique. Acclamation means um, uh, you, your cornea has got a, a sort of curve shape, um, and the Goldman is, is, is sort of trying to compress that curve and see how much pressure it mean, needs to sort of press that, that front bit of um, your eye and make it flat 
So that's the plane bit is about making it flat within that word. And tonometry is um, science speak for measuring pressure. But again, it's the, it's the terminology, Goldman Appalachian Tonometry, that's saying that this particular technique was used. There's lots of different techniques out there. Um, and the Goldman is the, the kind of best practice. So it's saying if the, if the letter that mentions Goldman uh, Gap or Goldman Appalachian is saying it was measured using the, the kind of the best the best type of equipment, um, which is pretty standard. Um, and you you might well experience um, numbing drops because it obviously can be very unpleasant to have something put on your, the front of your eye. So you might have the local anaesthetic drops or numbing drops put on your eye in, in, in advance. Um, so that's the sort of standard test that you would have um, every single glaucoma appointment, every single eye test. Um, might Well, uh, not every eye test in an optometrist, but there, if there's sort of any risk factors for glaucoma, they might be testing your IOP or intraocular eye uh, pressure or eye pressure. Um, another test you might have at your optometrist is OCT. Um, they're a bit more alphabetic spaghetti. That's optical coherent tomography. Um, optical means it is using light. Um, coherence is the yeah, kind of looking at the different angles. And tomography is sort of measuring um, what's happening on the, the sort of surface of things. So what that means is it's a it's a non-invasive test which is looking at the different layers in the retina, which is all the stuff at the bottom of the eye. Um, and early damage to the sort of nerve fiber layers within the retina um, are indicative of glaucoma. Um, so because because glaucoma is about the sort of damage of those nerves being sent to the eye, if those nerves are getting thinner, um, that suggests you might have glaucoma. Um, and it, it's sort of what, what thinner means for you. People might have all sorts of varieties of thickness of the, the retinal fiber layers, um, uh, uh, but they're, they're looking at kind of change over time and seeing it be thinner. Um, so yeah, that, that's more and more common now to have OCT. Um, there's all sorts of clever wizardry that can be done to sort of using OCT to look at different parts of the eye. Um, and it, it takes about 10 minutes and it doesn't hurt, um, but it can be very, very useful in terms of identifying kind of change and therefore whether your glaucoma is getting worse. Next slide. Um, and gonioscopy is another bit of terminology that you might see. Um, and it's it measures how how sort of closed or open the angle is in your eye. So the angle of your eye is where the um, the iris and the cornea um, meet, um, and that's where the, uh, the the fluid in glaucoma is draining out of. Um, so if that angle is sort of very very narrow, that makes it hard for the, the fluid to, to to drain through. Um, it, it's more liable to get sort of glued up. Um, those the, the sort of um, yeah, there's two parts that I that I was in the cornea. Um and, and it can be measured using a kind of special lens that's placed on the eye and you can see into the um into that angle. Um uh and the within the angle, um or yeah, it can be sort of graded um to tell you how narrow that lens is. So this is relevant for people who have angle closure or narrow angles, which is the, the kind of risk factor for um angle closure. So um, we want to be at grade four, where the um, uh, you can see those sort of lines in the in the picture below are diverging, um, and and you want to be grade four. So you want there to be sort of a gap between the um, the iris and the the sclera, um, and if it goes down to zero, if your um, angle is closed. Um, so it's really that that you know the the consultant will be looking at that to to see whether there's a risk factor for um, for your angles closing and having what's called an angle closure attack. Um, and, you know, it's just a way of monitoring it. But if you're in the kind of, you know, the three, four category, you're fine. Um, and if you're in the, the kind of one or two category, then you, you may be at risk and you might be recommended to have that peripheral iridotomy procedure we just talked about. Um, and if, you, if you're closed, you're kind of probably in a lot of pain because that's probably when you've had an angle closure attack. Um, and just finishing off this letter, so he continues on latanoprost to both eyes. So that's the, the consultant telling the GP um, that that's the, the prescription. It's having it in both eyes. Um, and um, what you'll notice there is, um, for those of you who are, are kind of um, on top of your eye drops and know your different names, latanoprost is what's called a generic. So it's just like the, the kind of um, the, the name of the kind of active ingredient within the eye drop. The active um, product within the eye drop, um, uh, rather than 
giving you a, a branded name, so it's a monocost or something like that, would would be a, a, a prostaglandin that that's a branded one. Um, the some people like the branded ones because they tend to, you know, they come in the same bottle each time. They're maybe more likely to be preservative free at that starting stage. Um, they, you know, maybe you kind of get on better with that that particular um, eye drop. But in this context, because the consultant has only written about the about it being latanoprost, which is the generic, um, the GP would only be able to prescribe the generic latanoprost based on the information from the GP, so where, uh, from the consultant. So when this man is going back to the GP and asking for a repeat prescription, if he says, I want, you know, monopost or, or whichever sort of branded version, the GP might struggle with that because the consultant has only said the generic, the latanoprost one. So if you, um, if you know that only a particular of the kind of the branded drops um, are, are what works for you, um, you might need to go back to your consultant and say that the GP only has information about the generic one, um, and and I want my my sort of branded version. I get on better with it. I'm more likely to put my tops in if I if you give me this generic uh, the the branded version. Um, so it's a bit it's a, it's it's a bit like being prescribed generic like ibuprofen, which you can buy for kind of fifty p in the in any old supermarket compared to Nurofen, it's exactly the same um, product. In both cases, the ibuprofen is exactly the same, but the Nurofen sort of looks different and um, might come in sort of a, a nicer tablet or something. I think probably you might prefer taking the Nurofen. So in each case, it's it's exactly the same drug that you're being given. It just depends on kind of the, you know, other bits in the formulation, whether those preservatives are in there and things like that. And the generic ones are cheaper, that's why. Um, GPs will, will prescribe generics unless they're given um, a specific reason to prescribe the branded one. Um, yeah, they're, they're significantly cheaper because you're not you know, it's like like ibuprofen and urofen. Um, and that last sentence is now on the waiting list for right baker emulsification with IOL, and I will review them again in three months' time. So faker emulsification um, is that um, uh, the the procedure. Um, where the the, art of the natural lens, which might be cloudy, um, has is removed and replaced with a IOL, which is intraocular lens, um, and that's that's your artificial lens, which is thinner, as I was saying before, and um, might relieve some of the pressure in the eye. And then the right is just referring to the the right eye, um, because if uh, previously in the letter we saw that the left eye had already been treated. Okay, so there's a talk through kind of two sample letters. Um, and what I just wanted to talk about a little bit now was um, why some of these words look so complicated and why some of them can be so similar. Um, and, and just helping you understand sort of the building blocks that go into some of these this sort of scientific or medical terminology so that they, they become a bit less blurry um, when you read them and you can understand them a little bit more about the... Um, about the difference between them. So if you can click the next bit, please. So the, the table's gonna um, pop up some, some different words. So if you look on that left-hand column, um, there are three words that all look quite similar. So trabeculectomy, trabeculoplasty, and trabeculotomy. They are all um, words that, that come up in, in glaucoma um, and they're all very similar. So what on earth's going on? Why are they all so similar? And what we need to understand is the, the different parts of those words. So they all have the same root, um, the same first, you know, seven or eight letters. And that's talking about the particular part of the body. And in this case, all of those different words are talking about the trabecular meshwork, which is the bit of the eye that the fluid's draining out of. So that's why they all start trabecule, trabecule um, because it's talking about the trabecular meshwork. And then the ending is talking about that procedure and what are we doing to it. So the first one, trabeculectomy, that, that ectomy means removal. Um, so that's the um, where the um, the surgery that happens where you're, you're sort of almost bypassing the trabecular meshwork, you're getting a, a kind of flap cut into your eye, um, like a kind of valve in a pressure cooker um, and providing an alternative route. So what's happening is they're sort of bypassing the whole of the trabeculectomy. 
Um, there's lots of other words, um, other medical procedures that, that end in ectomy that may be more familiar. So appendectomy would be if your appendix is removed. Um, hysterectomy, um, some women might have had, which is a, um, the removal of the womb. So the similarity of all of those is the ending ectomy, and that means removal. Um, trabecular plasty, um, so the ending that we're looking at is the, the kind of plasty bit, and that means to modify or to change um, from plastic surgery is would be kind of plasty. So a rhinoplasty um, is, a, is a nose job um, because you're sort of modifying, changing the nose. Um, and an angioplasty is um, might be if you have a stent put in in your um, one of the um, arteries around your heart. Um, so it's sort of modifying the, the kind of arteries associated with your heart. And then the trabeculotomy, the ending of that word is cutting. Um, so that would, that's a procedure where the, um, uh, the trabecular mesh work is cut. Um, and other examples of a um, optomy word would be a lobotomy is probably the most famous word. So that's when the, the front bit of the brain is, is cut if um, someone's got uh, serious kind of behavioural um, issues. Or episiotomy might be familiar to women um, when they're giving birth if they're um, struggling to um, give birth. It's where the, there's a cut made um, to help a woman give birth, make her but, uh, birth canal slightly bigger. So you'll see there that kind of that you know you see the same endings of different words, um, and they're they're kind of um, you know the the ending of the word is saying what you're doing to it, and the beginning of the word is is talking about the body part. Um, another um, bit of terminology to help you sort of understand where where how words are made and um, you know where the scientific terminology comes from. Um, we've got some names of some eye drops. Peter, if you could click twice more. Perfect. So we've got six six eye drops there. Latanoprost, bimatoprost, bitaxolol, timolol, brinzolamide, and fluorzolamide. So they're drugs from three different classes, and the end of the word is telling you what class of drug these drops are from. Um, they, the, the beginning of the word would be um, made up basically by the, the pharmaceutical company that has, um, that has signified it. So latanoprost and bimatoprost are both prostaglandin analogues. Um, so the prost is telling you that they're a prostaglandin analogue. Um, latanoprost and bimatoprost would have very, very similar chemical structures. Um, so they'd work on the same bit, the same uh, sort of receptor, the same kind of bit of the, um, you know, the eye, the, the bevascular bit of the eye that's making it work. Um, so they're, they're slightly different, but the prost is telling you they'd be the same drop, they're prostaglandin analogues. The bitaxolol and timolol, um, the, the ending of those words is the same, they're both beta blockers. Um, so the lol um, is actually, or the ol, is um, actually telling a chemist, which is what we have, I have a chemistry degree, um, that there's a, um, an alcohol, intriguing, there's an alcohol group in that, in that structure, but the point is they're both ols and they're both beta blockers. And then the brinzolamide and thorzolamide, you can see the ending is the same, they both are from the same class of drug, which is the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Um, so again, the amide, um, so a chemist slightly, um, means that um, it's telling you a bit about the structure of the, of the compound. Um, but from your point, you know, if you're not a chemist and you're not into chemical structures, um, then it's just telling you that it's a, it's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Um, so uh, Peter, if you click again. There we go. So, you know, those different um, drug names are, are telling you a little bit. They, they look like gobbledygook until you sort of start to put them together and then you realise that the ending of the word is telling you a little bit about the, about the class of drug. So this, this terminology, it can be sort of terribly confusing, but if you, if you start to look at those words and sort of look at the ending and break it down, sometimes you'll be able to kind of um, get a bit more of a, an understanding and it will, uh, it will be a bit less gobbledygook and a bit more kind of look, you know, see the themes and, and see what are the kind of important bits of the words that you want to know about. Um, and that is it. So I think I'll go over to questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Joe. We'll move on to questions and answer session now. I hope you can all hear me clearly. I'm sorry about the quality of sound earlier on. I'll roll on with the questions. Do some ophthalmologists actually write like this, given that GP letters should be copied to the patient and therefore understandably by them, understandable by them, this sort of abbreviated jargon 
is absolutely inexcusable. I think they probably do. Um, I think it's very um, easy to underestimate for an ophthalmologist how what someone's understanding is and um, uh, you know they're as far as they're concerned they're talking from a GP uh, from a doctor to another doctor um, and what matters is communicating very clearly in a way that the GP is going to read um, rather than um, uh, rather than uh, necessarily thinking about the patient and um, and we are working um to a certain extent with the um uh uh the you know world of doctors to help them improve the um improve the letters um so that people understand them better great okay the next question i have heard that there could be problems concerning glaucoma patients who need both cataract ops and a stent if the cataract surgery has already be, been done could a future stent op have a bearing on this or vice versa? Or is it better to have both done together? This is a is this a common dilemma? Um, I'm afraid I can't answer that because I'm not actually a doctor. Um, so what I would um, recommend is that the person calls the helpline um, or speaks to the um, uh, their consultant. I do know that um, if you have a trachealectomy, um, it can make it more likely to have um, a cataract, but I, I don't know about a stent, sorry. Okay, no problem. That's great. Please call the helpline. I really like getting a copy of the hospital letter. At my eye hospital, it happens automatically. It's useful to take to the optician and, if necessary, to the GP. I make my own notes afterwards about what the specialist has said, as it's a long time, often between appointments, and easy to forget. It doesn't need an answer, that one. No, but I think it's a really good point. And I think we would um, definitely recommend that people take notes, um, go with sort of questions that you you have, um, take notes if you want the consultant to um, explain in a bit more detail um, what's going on, um, then, you know, they are very, very able to do that. Um, we have a product available on our website um, uh, called the it's sort of glaucoma monitoring book. Um, and then that that could be quite a good way of it, it's got on there kind of um, you know notes that you can make at each appointment and you would take that to each appointment um, and then that can help with that kind of continuity of care if it's been sort of over a year between your appointments um, uh, yeah it can it can help with that so it's really important it's a very very good point by that person to sort of you know be engaged in that as much as possible um, and if you've had a letter through from, if you've been copied into a letter from your consultant to the GP and you don't understand it, um, I know that our helpline have taken calls um, and sort of explained what's in the letter to people um, or, you know, go back to your consultant and say kind of this is what you said in the last letter. Can you explain it to me? It's really, really important um, that, that people do understand their own, their own glaucoma. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next question, I've got about three more altogether. And how much is added or subtracted to the pressure reading for thin or thick corneas? I, again, I'm sorry, I don't quite know the answer to that one because um, I'm not an optometrist, which is um, the profession that would know most about that. And it would depend on how thick or thin your cornea is. Um, you know, the thinner it is, the more that would need to be um, added, um, but I, I don't know the numbers, I'm afraid you'll have to um, call the helpline and they, they should be able to help you. Great, that's what the helpline is there for, so please feel free to call it if you have any more questions. Two last ones here, uh, Joanne. What is PXF? So PXF is a type of glaucoma called pseudo-exfoliative glaucoma um, and that's when bits in the um, the lens when as the lens kind of moves um it um it, it sort of flakes a bit a bit like dandruff and those flakes can get caught in the um in the trabecular meshwork and make it harder for um the 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 fluid to drain out of the eye um and pds is is one that's a bit similar that's called pigment dispersion syndrome um and that's when the 
um, colours in the, the sort of pigment in the iris can come off again as the kind of iris is moving. Um, and again, it can sort of clog up the trabecular meshwork. So they're both types of secondary glaucoma. Um, um, and you can, yeah, there's more information on our, in our booklets about it. Okay, the last and final question. Uh, what is PPA? I should have checked this because I know this is a question from Helen. This was peripupillary, peripupillary, I can't remember the A. Pete, you're going to have to help atrophy? me. Out. Sorry? Is it peripillary atrophy? Atrophy. Atrophy. Sorry, I can't. Remember. Yeah, so ah, yeah, so that's the kind of nerves. Um, atrophy is when the the kind of nerves are um, are sort of weakening and not getting as kind of robust and and healthy. So is it a thinning of the nerve fibre? Of the nerves, nerves, exactly. It's a thinning of the nerve fibre, so it's sort of indicative right. of glaucoma. I can see a few a few people have made comments about the amount of terminology that we've presented. All of these, those sort of two letters. Um, that were examples are both from previous copies of our Insight magazine. So, um, if where they it's sort of explained in a bit more detail. Um, so if you if you want, we can um, put into the uh, the follow up email, Pete. Perhaps we can do this before it goes out tomorrow um, to to provide people with the links to those Insight articles. Where and then you can sort of sit and. Um, look at the terminology in a bit more detail and those diagrams a bit more slowly um, in your own time. Okay, um, I've it... three more questions just pop in, yep. Joe. Uh, this has been extremely useful. Thank you. Glaucoma UK website, I believe, has a glossary, but further explanation and examples is useful to give the word contact. So thank you for that. The next one, I have a comment from my eye specialist, encapsulated beard, B-E-R-D, slash tenon's cyst. What is this? I don't have to say, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. I mean, a cyst is like a, a, a sort of growth, um, a sort of body of cells, um, and, and a tenon is, is part of the eye, it's part of the sort of structures in the eye that are holding things together. Um, so it would be something on the on the surface of the eye, on the, the sclera, but I don't know enough about it. Um, so if they so call the helpline again? From again, call the helpline. Um, Fantastic. I'll go back to your consultant if you need. Great. Just two more comments at the end. Many thanks. Yeah. Very helpful. And this has been a great session. So helpful in interpreting those letters. So thank you, Joanna, for your presentation and for all your answers. And if we have any answers left, please call the helpline. The number is 01233 648170. Or if you want to email, it's helpline at Glaucoma UK. And we are open Monday to Friday, 9.30 to 5. So I'm going to launch our second poll now to see how much you have taken away from the session. Bear with me a moment. I'm having issues with the poll, I'm afraid, so I think I'm going to have to give that one a miss for this evening. I'm so sorry. And uh, just one or two more things to share with you. Uh, we're celebrating our 50 years in existence at the Comi UK, so it's a very exciting time for us. And as World Lacoma Week is coming up soon on the 10th of March, um, we will have on Monday, the 11th of March, our session will be Glaucoma Care in Singapore and Australia at 9 in the morning till 10 a.m. And you're going to have a busy day on the Monday at between 1 and 2 p.m. Glaucoma Collaboration, UK and Africa. And then on Tuesday, the 12th of March, uh, we will have in the evening, the usual time in the evening, 7 to 8 p.m., Glaucoma from Ghana. So, and then the following one in April on the 22nd of April will be from 7 to 8 p.m. And we've a panel of three guest speakers for an open Q&A session, all things about glaucoma. 
So please consider completing the survey which will launch when this webinar ends. We want these sessions to be great. So the more feedback we receive from you, the better the sessions we will provide. So thank you for spending the evening with us. I hope you found it very beneficial and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much, everyone.